Samantha Williams from the University of Central Oklahoma, uh, and we are in the psychology department. So today we're going to talk to you about parent-child interaction therapy, uh, otherwise known as PCIT. So what we're going to start off by doing is introducing PCIT um, and really defining what it is, and then of course the theoretical framework behind PCIT. Um, after that, we're going to talk about who can benefit from PCIT, and then we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to break this into half. So we're, this first half is going to focus on what I just spoke about, and then the second half, we're going to talk about the therapy um, and specifically. So PCIT, it stands for Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, and the goal um, of PCIT is to change the interactions between parents and their child to increase pro-social behaviors and decrease problem behaviors. And then so a little bit of like the magic behind the scenes with the theoretical framework is um, there's three different theories um, that are incorporated. The developmental theory of parenting, um, attachment theory, and social learning theory. So, in the developmental theory of parenting uh, is from Baumrind, uh, and he, has, he outlines the different parenting styles. So, there's the authoritative, um, authoritarian, and then the indulgent or permissive parenting style. So, we really kind of want to talk about each parenting style and the pros and cons of each um, to really decide which parenting style is best, which one should we use, um, and then how that is applied to PCIT. So in the authoritative parenting style, it's going to be a demanding and responsive. Um, so you're demanding, you're making a demand of the child, but you're also responsive to their emotional um, content and, and how they're projecting themselves. In the authoritarian um, parenting style, you're really being demanding but not responsive to the child. So it's just constant demands back and forth to the child and never really responding to if they even want to do um, what you're asking of them. Um, the indulgent or permissive parenting style, um, you're responsive um, but not demanding. So you're, you're always just responding to their emotional state um, but you're not keeping a demand in place for them. So if you're keeping notes, um, that we are talking about Baumrind's theory of uh, developmental theory of parenting. And so we've talked about the authoritarian, the authoritative, and the indulgent parenting styles. So we want to give you some examples of each of the parenting styles as well as explaining kind of what they are so that you really have a good idea of which one is. So the authoritative parenting style um, example would be a three-year-old girl grabbing a toy from um, his playmate or her playmate and the authoritative parent would say something along the lines of I understand that you would also like to play with this toy um, but your, fun, your friend is playing with this toy now maybe in a few minutes you can take turns playing with the toy um, and so with this response you see that you're being firm but you're also being sensitive to the child's wants or needs and then in the authoritarian um this would look like with that same example so a three-year-old grabbing a toy from a friend um, and they would demand that the child return the toy right away not um giving any any um attention to the fact that they may want to play with that toy and teaching them that even though they want to play with that toy um, someone else is playing with it right now and if you wait um, you guys can take turns with it and then you have the permissive and so in this one and with the same example um, this parent would choose not to intervene at all so be more of an observer from the sidelines and they will often rationalize child's behavior so um, they're just going to let the grabbing of the toy go on and not teach them that um, it's not okay to take other people's toys. It's okay to wait and take turns, but we shouldn't just grab. So with each of these parenting styles that we've discussed, you could probably pick out which one is the best parenting style to use. 
Um, of course, that would be the authoritative parenting style. So we still want to have um, rules and demands for our children, uh, but we also want to respond to their emotional state uh, and for better psychological health. And then so attachment theory, of course we know that Bowlby thought that um, there should be an approach to social and emotional development. And so one of um, the ideas that he proposed was that young children seek proximity to their caregiver, especially um, in times when they may experience distress. And that that caregiver provides a secure base for them to explore and learn new skills. And then um, Ainsworth came along and she furthered the research um, with this particular theory. And um, she's of course known for the strange situation. So um, from the st strange situation, we got the attachment classifications, um, secure, resistant, ambivalent, avoidant, and disorganized. So with the secure attachment, um, they will go explore and check back in. So um, they use that their caregiver or parent as that secure base that they explore their environment and surroundings and they'll just check back in occasionally. Whereas the res resistant ambivalent attachment style is characterized by an intense distress when the mother leaves and they approach the parent but they'll often push the parent away at the same time. And then with the avoidant um, attachment classification, you'll see that there's no distress when their caregiver leaves and they're okay with stranger's attention. It does, they're, not, they're not worried about the stranger that's there. And then with the disorganized attachment style, you'll see a strong proximity to... Um, strong proximity seeking uh, followed by uh, strong avoidance same time. Um, and so we're going to move on to um, the next theory in the framework, uh, which is uh, social learning theory uh, developed by Bandura. Um, and so you'll remember in Bandura's uh, research, he had the Bo Bill Dahl study uh, that's been reviewed many, many times and is a classic in the field of psychology. So we won't go into that, but uh, basically we learn from what we learned from his research is that learning is not purely behavioral, um, but rather it's a, a cognitive process that takes place in, in a social context. Um, so learning doesn't have to occur by uh, just doing a behavior and then getting the reward or the consequence from that uh, and then that shaping the behavior, but rather uh, you, you can learn by observing the, the consequences of behavior from others, um, which would be vicarious uh, reinforcement. Um, so basically learning involves the observation, uh, extraction of information uh, from those observations and making decisions about the performance of the behavior. Um, thus learning can occur without an observable change in behavior. Uh, to further the discussion over the social learning theory, uh, we wanted to, to make sure and get across that the learners not just a passive recipient of inf information, but rather cognition, uh, environment, and behavior all interact uh, to form uh, mutually influenced learning. All right, so if you've been keeping notes, um, we've talked about the goals of PCIT and how they include um, using the developmental theory of parenting to teach the parents the authoritative parenting style and that parenting style is both demanding and responsive. We also talked about attachment theory and how the parent should be in a secure base where the kids can um, check in with and then also just continue to explore their environment and learn new skills. We've also talked about uh, social learning theory, um, so which is teaching specific parental behavior management skills um, rather than uh, instead of behavioral interventions. Um, so we'll move on to integrate all of these theoretical um, backgrounds into PCIT. Um, so more of the goals of PCIT uh, are to improve the parents' use of associate uh, appropriate discipline skills and strategies, uh, which would increase children's social skills, 
improve children's uh, minding and listening, uh, as well as improve the parent and child uh, or caregiver relationship as a whole. Okay, so now we can start talking about um, who can benefit most from PCIT. Um, so PCIT is intended for children um, ages two to seven, um, but there is some research that suggests that um, a, uh, children ages two through 12 um, who have a history of neglect, physical abuse, um, or prenatal substance exposure would also benefit from uh, parent-child interaction therapy. And then um, within that, um, kids who have oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, um, ADHD, behavioral problems, um, or kids who come from a background with abusive families, um, and then also diverse backgrounds in general. So there's research that suggests that um, PCIT is effective not just in America, but also across the globe. So what we really want to know is, does PCIT work? And if it does, how well does it work? Um, so to outline a little bit of research behind it, uh, we looked at one study that um, investigated a group uh, of people who have completed the PCIT program. Uh, and I looked at them three to six years um, after the, the treatment was completed. Um, and they found that the children not only maintained um, their gains from the therapy, but they also um, actually improved their skills as well, rather than just staying uh, plateaued where they, they finished up therapy at. Um, so that's actually three quarters of the sample that they measured uh, retained those behavioral gains. Uh, another quarter of the sample uh, the, court, the remaining quarter of the sample, uh, of course, did not have their uh, behavioral gains ma uh, maintained. So with the effect size, uh, for those of us who look at the stats, um, the effect sizes are good uh, for the research. So they, we observe medium to large effect sizes uh, among families who complete the treatment. So that's measured by observing the skills used by par both parents uh, and then the parents reported disruptive behaviors. So that concludes the first part of our discussion today. So the second part is going to look at the sessions uh, more specifically. So we're going to look at what the components of each session are and then also what skills uh, we're going to be taught in each session. Um, and then also what techniques that parents are taught within each session. So first, before we get into the skills that are taught, it's important that we talk about um, how the therapy room is set up. So um, in the therapy room, there should be appropriate toys. And when we say appropriate toys, these are toys that are appropriate for um, encouraging the atmosphere of interaction between um, caregivers and their children. So these would be toys like board games, um, coloring books, action figures, blocks, um, things that they that the caregiver and the child can really do together. Examples of inappropriate toys might be um, video games and one of the reasons why those would be inappropriate is because they don't encourage a interaction between the child and their caregiver and it's really more of a solo um, player game. So you definitely want something that's going to include both of them. And then you would also want to have a buffer room, and this buffer room is considered the timeout area. So um, we'll talk more about timeout here in just a little bit when we get into the skills involved in each of the um, different interactions. And um, the, there's a timeout chair within the room, and then the buffer room is for whenever the timeout chair doesn't work. So then there is this other room that um, has a one-way mirror and the therapist sits in this room and observes the parent and child interacting and they communicate with the um, parent or caregiver via earpiece and um, so they'll encourage the parent to continue using appropriate skills that they're working on and say hey maybe maybe don't be so critical in this area let's focus on those skills that we're really trying to target 
and um, they're there to guide the parent through the whole process. So that's one of the really neat things about uh, PCIT versus some other therapies is that they're getting live uh, feedback as far as how they're doing in that therapy session. Um, and so like Sam has talked about, they have an earpiece in um, that is really kind of cool thinking as, as dads getting involved in, um, and being interested in the therapy because they can look like a secret agent or something. Um, and so the, the therapist, like Sam said, is speaking into a microphone uh, and then giving uh, both parents, uh, if they're both in the therapy session or if it's just one, uh, giving live feedback uh, and tips and, uh, and things about how they're interacting with their child. Uh, and then so they're going to be reviewing those skills and, and encouraging what skills to, to keep working on uh, during that session. So within each, each therapy session, um, there's going to be a few different segments. Um, and so the breakdown of those segments looks a little bit like this, and it could change a little bit depending upon um, the progress of the therapy and everything. So um, during the first, uh, the first part is a teaching session. So what are we going to work on in this session? They're going to, the therapist is going to teach the parent the skills. Um, so they're going to explain, model, and then also role play those skills that they're going to be expected to use with the children. Uh, the second part would be a coaching session. Um, so this is where the earpiece um, and the live feedback comes in. So at, at this point, the parents practice those skills um, in the room while the therapist is watching on the other side of a two-way mirror um, and getting that feedback. So the third part, uh, which is a very crucial part of the therapy, is the review. Um, and at this part, um, they will go over data. So the therapist is going to collect data during the therapy session, uh, measuring how often the new skills were used, how often they were used appropriately, and how often inappropriate skills were used. Um, and that's a critical part of guiding the therapy um, and its progress. Uh, additionally, with that data, then they're going to have a graph for each therapy session and then a global graph uh, for the whole therapy series. Um, and so they're going to to graph points of data uh, each time and review that graph as well. So um, earlier we alluded to the fact that parents are taught skills versus um, behavioral interventions. And the reason for that is because skills can be generalized and applied to multiple settings and in multiple environments. So within um, parent-child interaction therapy we have uh, two different interaction types and within those different skills are taught. So the first one is going to be the child directed interaction and um, in this interaction it's really the child leading. So parents are taught skills that help them um, become comfortable with letting their child lead and not um, and not feeling like they have to direct every interaction that they have. Whereas the parent-directed interaction is after we've talked about all those skills and we've mastered those, we're going to go into, okay, so now how can we implement strategies um, that can uh, help with minding and listening and how can we make effective consequences and um, set up all of those contingencies. So um, like I said before, in the child-directed interaction, um, the parents following the child's lead. And the parents are learning specific communication skills. They're learning to give attention to positive behaviors and ignore the problem behaviors. And this is something that we call differential social attention. And then the, parent, the therapist is focusing on reinforcing the parent's use of the skills that we're getting ready to talk about. Yeah, so they have both do skills and don't skills that the therapist teaches. Um, so a, a few examples of a do skill uh, would be labeled praises. And so what does that look like? Well, that's, that's something that's designed to increase a, a behavior. So that might be uh, the parent telling the child, good job of cleaning up. I really like how you did that. Or I like how you're being quiet. Um, another one would be like, thank you for sharing your toy. Um, and so those are labeled praises which are going to increase that the, the frequency of that behavior happening in the future. The next skill, uh, that's a do skill, uh, is going to be a reflection. So this is really just 
the uh, parent following the child's lead, like Sam has talked about, and just really just labeling what the child is doing. Um, so it shows that the parent is listening um, to the child uh, and really understanding what the child is saying or doing, um, which improves uh, speech and clarifies ideas. Um, so an example of this uh, is a child saying, I drew a tree, and the parent would be, their response would be, yes, a big tree. So that's not the parent taking what the child said and then turning it into something else. It's acknowledging, yes, you did draw, draw a tree, and this is what it looks like. And it's almost reaffirming what the child's done. Right. Uh, and then so the third do skill uh, is just behavioral description. Uh, and so, there again, in this skill, uh, it's letting the child lead the activity. Um, so this is showing that you're interested in what the child is doing, uh, and it also teaches broader concepts and builds vocabulary. Uh, and then it also help, helps to hold the child's attention on the task. Um, so another example of that would be um, just watching the child in what they're doing. So, hey, you're building a fort, uh, rather than not whether the child says anything or not. Um, another one could be, and this is a little bit maybe for an older child, um, but looking at a picture that they drew and they, hey, you drew six petals on that flower. Um, and so that's helping not only just describe their behavior and reaffirming what they're doing, but also can help count because then you can, can count on each, count each petal and you're working on number skills as well. Whammy, double whammy. Um, another way to think of behavioral descriptions is being a sports announcer. So whenever you watch ESPN or any sport, basketball game, baseball game, you always, or football, you always have the announcers that are commentating so that way people who may not be able to watch TV but are rather listening through the radio know exactly what's going on. So behavioral descriptions is the parents being the sports announcer. And so you can almost think of it as like, so how would you describe what your child is doing? Um, so that way if somebody who is not in the room with you would know what was going on. And then you have don't skills, and so the don't skills within child-directed interaction is going to be commands. So, of course, when you give a command, you're taking the lead away from the child, which is really the opposite of what we want during child-directed interaction. Um, and then it also risks having a negative interaction. So we're not really to the point yet where we're going to give commands because we're we haven't even talked about how to give effective commands, which comes along later. Um, so there's a chance that you are going to have a negative interaction from this. And the whole point is to start developing those positive interactions, especially within therapy sessions. So that way, when you go home and practice, um, you're practicing the right skills. And you don't ever get into a situation where you don't know how to handle it. Um, and so these commands are normally going to be indirect commands. So it'll be like, let's play with the cars or um, give me the red car, which is more of a direct command. But um, another don't skill is questions. So um, questions might be a way that parents or caregivers can hide commands that they're giving. And it also suggests that you're not listening. So if they say, look, I drew a tree and you said, oh, what did you draw? That might seem to the child that you're not paying attention to what I'm doing at all. Um, so it also suggests that you might disapprove of what they're doing. Um, so you could say something like, oh, you drew a tree? Well, why didn't you draw a house instead? So you're just taking what they've done and almost criticizing it through a question. Um, and so just examples um, would be, can you tell me what this color is? Um, we're building a big house, aren't we? And they may seem really innocent, but it really takes away from the child directing interaction. And there's also critical statements, and that's another don't skill. And critical statements, it will, um, they lower the self-esteem of the children. And um, it can also create unpleasant interactions, and it increases the criticized behaviors. Because if you really break it down and think about it, when you're criticizing how a child is behaving, you're giving attention. Um, whether you intend to or not, 
that's how they're getting attention from you. So they're going to be more likely to engage in that behavior. So that's one reason why during child-directed interaction, no critical statements. And um, examples are those are statements like, you have it wrong. Um, your tower is crooked. That's not a good idea. Or stop fidgeting. So with all those skills, uh, of course the don't skills, like Sam has said, we don't want to take away from what the child is doing. We really want to let the child uh, be able to lead the interaction and then uh, build confidence from that as well. Um, in addition to the do's and don't skills, uh, we're also going to teach different skills that we affectionately call the pride skills. Um, and so the pride is an acronym uh, that stands for praise, reflect, imitate, describe, and then enjoy. Um, so what are we doing in each one of these? Uh, so in the praise, it's just basically like some of these do skills. Um, just thank you for sharing with me. Uh, so you're acknowledging what the child has done and then reaffirming that, hey, that was a good move. Um, and then so reflecting, um, yes, that is a block. Uh, if the child hands you a block and says block. Um, so imitate, uh, that could be something like staying with the block example. Uh, if the child is playing with a block, stacking them on top of each other, maybe you go over there with them and start stacking blocks along with them. Uh, with the describe uh, step, um, that could be something like sticking with the blocks again. Uh, if you're building a tower, hey, you're building a tall tower, you're stacking multiple blocks on each other, um, something like that. Um, and of course, tailor the language that you're using to the age of the child and, and use language that would be appropriate um, for them. Uh, and then it's also important to enjoy. Uh, you're, you're spending time with your children, um, and so you're really just, you want to focus on, again, Hey, you're having fun. Uh, yes, it is therapy and you're building important skills that aren't necessarily easy to do. They may sound easy, but in practice they can be difficult. Um, but it's important to remember to just keep enjoying um, your interactions with your children. So, um, one thing that is great about PCIT is it is because the focus is so heavy on the skills, before moving from the child-directed interaction, the parents actually have to be able to meet a certain criteria. And so that criteria is having 10 behavioral descriptions, 10 reflective statements, 10 labeled praises, and no more than three total questions, commands, or criticisms. And this data and how this is decided is um, during the first five minutes of the child-directed interaction. Um, and this is where the therapist codes and um, after that, that's whenever they start coaching the parents and what they need to work on. So like what Sam was saying, um, the therapist is going to code the behavior. So that what that means is basically on their data sheet, they're going to check um, how many times the behavior has occurred. Um, that way you can track the progress, um, and then also, more importantly, track the skills that need to be further worked on um, within the therapy session. So after the child-directed interaction uh, has been mastered, then you can move on to the parent-directed interaction. So what is the parent-directed interaction? Well, that aims to decrease non-compliance uh, and inappropriate behaviors in the children. Um, so those that don't respond to ignoring or that are too severe to ignore. Um, this is going to teach parents to how to give effective commands um, and then also teach a parent how to give effective warnings. Um, so we want to go over a, a few examples of, of rules for commands. Um, and so giving a command is a more complicated thing than it may seem um, to be effective. Uh, and so there's do's and don'ts with those again. Um, and so you really want to be um, cognizant of what you're saying in that command in order to, to convey it clearly to the child. Um, so you want to make commands direct rather than indirect for the child. So the reasons for that is that it, it leaves no question in the child's mind about what you're expecting them to do. Um, so an example would be, uh, please hand me the toy car. That doesn't leave a whole lot of gray area for the child to be confused at, at what you're expecting of them. Uh, another example could be, uh, put the block back in the box. Again, it's a very specific command uh, for the child so that they're not confused about what you're doing. Uh, a second one would be uh, stating commands positively. Um, so 
that is telling the child what to do rather than what not to do. And that's a really difficult one for, for parents to work on. Um, and it may not seem that way just thinking about it, but when you're in practice, it is very difficult. Um, and so this is going to be saying things like, hey, come sit beside me rather than stop running around. And this is where um, those skills and the child directed interaction with the praise and focusing on good behaviors, it really comes in handy whenever you're talking about how to state commands positively. So focus on what you want them to do versus what you don't want them to do. Another um, effect, a role for effective commands would be to give the commands one at a time. You don't want to chain um, all these commands together into one chunk. So um, this might be something, an example of chaining the commands might be, okay, so you need to go pick up the cars, the puzzles, the blocks, the colors, uh, oh, put away the stuffed animals, and then expect the child to complete all five of those tasks. Um, more effectively would to get be to give them one step at a time. So, hey, Cade, will you go pick up the blocks? Or, and don't even say, will you go pick up the blocks? Cade, please go pick up the blocks. And so, after you go and pick up the blocks, then you give lots of praise and um, then you make your next command. Okay, so now we need to pick up the puzzles. So, please go pick up the puzzles. So one of the next if rules for an effective command is making it specific rather than vague, which we've kind of talked about a little bit already. Uh, but again, you, you don't want the child to have any confusion as far as uh, what they're expected to do. Um, so a, a quick example of that would be um, get down from the table rather than, hey, be careful. So what does that mean to the kid? They may not know. Uh, they're just mm -hmm. running around having fun. And then, so you want to make commands that are age appropriate. So, um, first of all, this just ensures that the child is going to be able to perform and understand what it is you're expecting of them. So, um, instead of saying draw a cube to a three-year-old, you might say draw a square. Um, a three-year-old might know what a square is, but they're definitely not going to know what a cube is. <laughs> Alright, so the final rule for an effective command is to give the commands politely and respectfully. Um, so that prevents the, the, the child from learning to obey only if yelled at. So that's, again, a very difficult skill for parents to, to master because our natural reaction is going to go, Whoa, whoa, stop, get down from there, no! Uh, and really what we should be doing is calmly saying, Hey, why don't you get down from the table? Or, hey, come sit beside me. Um, and so that's a, a more difficult skill. Um, it also prepares a child for school. So in school, hopefully the teacher's not always going to be yelling at the kid. At least that's the school that we want to put our kids in. So um, this is, and some examples of this could be, again, please give me the block rather than yelling at them. Hey, quit throwing that uh, or something like that. Um, and again, this is not yelling at the kid, give me the block now. Um, this is really, you're wanting to do it politely. So some more um, goals of the parent-directed interaction uh, is to teach parents what to do after the command has been given. Um, so give labeled praise if the child complies with the command. Uh, also, if the, child's, if the child disobeys, then initiate uh, the PCIT timeout sequence. Uh, and so this is a highly structured sequence. Um, and a very important part of PCIT therapy. Uh, another thing is to teach parents uh, to never ignore non-compliance. Uh, and then we also want to teach the importance of following through with each command. One, before we move on, one important thing to remember is that um, parents might come to a PCIT therapist and think that they're going to change their child's behavior, but really, PCIT and especially with parent-directed interaction and child-directed interaction, we're focusing on changing how the parent reacts in situations because the parent behavior is what leads to the child's behavior. Whether it's easy to realize that or not um, is may not be the case, but um, most of the time we're looking at changing parent behavior that then therefore changes the child's behavior.
Okay, so now we're gonna get into warnings. So warnings are what you use after you give your first direct command. So you're gonna give them about five, the ch child about five seconds to comply with whatever your direct command was. So if we have an example of um, like pick up the blocks, um, and you would want to give them five seconds to start picking up the blocks before you give your warning. And a warning should always follow an if-then prompt. So it should sound something like, if you don't pick up the blocks, then you go to the timeout chair. Um, and if it's very clear that compliance is not going to be given, so an example of that would be, um, you give your direct command to pick up the blocks and the child picks up the blocks and chunks it across the room, then you wouldn't even um, go into give them five seconds. Like you would just say, if you don't pick up the blocks, then you go to the timeout chair. And if they continue to not comply with the direct command, then it's very important that you follow through with your warning and take them to the timeout chair, which is not fun for parents and it's not fun for kids, but the follow through is what's really important. Yeah, and so again, when you're, if you do have to go to the chair, um, you wanna do it calmly again. Um, so an example of this would be saying, the, the parent again, structuring their command and their feedback uh, carefully. Um, so an example would be, you didn't do what I told you to do, so now you have to sit in the timeout chair. Um, and so you're, you're also going to add, you need to stay here until I say you can get off. Um, and so the, the time spent in the timeout chair varies upon the age, um, and which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, but generally about three minutes uh, for a younger child um, is, is kind of the standard uh, for sitting in the timeout chair. Um, after that, that timeout period, so if the, if the kid is sitting in the chair appropriately, um, then you're going to come back and you're going to say, you're sitting quietly on the chair. Are you ready to pick up the blocks? Um, and so you're keeping that demand in place after them taking part in the timeout procedure. Um, and at this point, you're actually, if you'll notice, you actually are asking the child the question rather than just saying, hey, you're going to go pick up the blocks. Uh, that's an important part um, because if the child says no, then you're going to reintroduce the timeout procedure over again. Um, that way you're teaching the child that just because they say no or defiant, they're still not going to get out of the demand. They're going to have to redo the timeout procedure. And another reason why it's important to keep the demand in place is because if they sit in the chair and you don't even say, are you ready to pick up the blocks? You're just like, okay, timeout's over. Um, then you're letting them escape the task that originally got them there in timeout. And when you do that, you're reinforcing going to the timeout chair. And honestly, we don't want timeout to be fun. We want timeout to be as boring as possible because it's a consequence for not complying with a task. So as part of what Sam just mentioned, we don't want timeout to be an escape uh, and an enjoyable experience. So that's where the, um, the buffer room comes in in the therapy setup. So the buffer room, it looks very bland. Uh, as, as bland as possible. So just the chair sitting in the middle of a room with no furniture and white walls and ceiling tiles is ideal. Uh, you don't want to have anything that could entertain or distract the child uh, from that time out. Um, so if, again, if the child is successful um, in that three minutes where they're sitting appropriately in the chair uh, and then they are willing to go and complete the original demand, then that's great and you return to the task uh, and, and then hopefully that uh, sequence is over with. Um, and then if anything happens except for that, then you're gonna say, well then you're gonna need to stay on the chair until I say you can get off. And then that time restarts. Uh, so that entire time segment restarts. Okay, so another reason why you might use the timeout room was um, if your child continually gets off the timeout chair before their time was up. So if this happens, then you would say something like, um, you got out of the chair before I said you could, so now you have to go to the timeout room. And um, the timeout room has a Dutch door on it. 
and the caregiver would just stand outside the room and remain there for one minute. And then they would get the child and revisit the timeout chair and make them sit for the time that they are supposed to sit there for. And it's so important that parents don't give in, don't concede, because um, I can guarantee you that their child is going to be saying things like, I hate you, I don't love you, you don't love me. And I mean, it's hard for a lot of parents to hear that, but you're better off in the long run if you don't concede and you don't give in because they don't mean what they're saying. They really don't. They're going to love you two minutes later, I promise. So um, it's important that you don't concede. And an important note here um, is that the buffer room is, it is actually separate from where the timeout chair is. So the buffer room uh, is if the child is continually non-compliant. Um, the buffer room is, is or physically harm, harming himself, herself, um, or someone else. The buffer room is really uh, a room where they can just kind of run around and get their temper tantrum out. Um, and then Without so, receiving attention for the temper tantrum. Right. Um, and then so again, with the um, with the timeout room, you're going to institute that time period. So if they complete it successfully, then great, uh, return to the task. Uh, if not, then you're going to restart that time period in the um, in the timeout room. And you're going to keep going until you get compliance with that first um, effective command that you gave. Right. So. Early on in the therapy, in the first and second parent-directed interaction sessions, um, you're really focusing on providing support for the parent, um, and you're, you're really looking at many opportunities to teach parents um, and the children appropriate behaviors. Uh, you're also going to provide behavioral interpretations as far as what they're doing, why maybe they're doing that, and then kind of turning that into this is how we need to do uh, appropriate behaviors, and this is why we need to do these behaviors instead. Um, and then also teaching relaxation um, and anger control techniques. Uh, that's crucial, especially in the fact that PCIT a lot of times is used with um, families that have uh, past history of abuse, like we've talked about a little bit earlier, um, and also a lot of the families that utilize PCIT are maybe adopted families uh, and things of that nature. And so both for the kids and the parents, uh, really being confident in anger control techniques is important. Of course, we're going to ensure that the parents understand and implement appropriately the timeout procedure. Another important part of the therapy process, just in general, is measuring um, how um, caregiver and child, their progress throughout the separate therapy sessions. So how this is done is the ECB, or the Iberg Child Behavior Inventory, um, is given to the parents at the start of each session and um, this is just a behavior inventory for the parents where they it's a rating form and they can um, rate if something's a problem and then they can even say um, if they view that as a problem so it might be something that happens like a little bit and so they rate it as a two but they don't really see that behavior as a problem, whereas um, another behavior like throwing, um, throwing objects might be rated as a five, and they do see that as a problem. So um, that just gives the parents um, a chance to rate be problem behaviors and the intensity of those behaviors and whether or not they think they're a problem. Right, and then also how confident they are uh, in the techniques that they're using um, as mm -hmm. well. For the confidence, the parents receive a self, a parent self-report of confidence, right. and um, it's important to know that before termination um, of therapy, the 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 parents have to score within a half of a standard deviation on the ECB, so um, they have to experience a decrease in intensity of problem behaviors, and. Um, Therapy also tends to run about 14 to 18 sessions, but there is no set time limit of we have to do this many sessions. It's truly how long does it take for the parents to master the skills. Right, so each, 
uh, one session to the next may not necessarily be a completely new skill the next time. Maybe one skill is really difficult for a certain set of parents um, to master. So, hey, we're going to work on the skill again next week rather than moving on to a new one. But there again, uh, the parents also have to express confidence in themselves to be able to do um, these behavioral strategies before moving on to um, the next session skill set. Um, and so what we found um, within research about PCIT uh, is we, wanna, we were concerned about therapy attrition. That's a huge problem in a lot of psychotherapy, uh, if not all psychotherapy, uh, because we're asking people to do something different than they've always done and something that's difficult that they don't always want to do. Um, so how do we keep people engaged? How do we keep people in therapy um, until they master the skills? Well, PCIT uh, does a pretty decent job of that. Um, there's a dropout rate of about 35%, uh, which compares pretty well when you look at the majority of other psychotherapy, um, which is most other psychotherapy ranges from about 40 to 60% uh, of dropout rate. Um, and so what that tells us is PCIT is, is pretty effective in keeping people engaged um, and happy. So that concludes what we have as far as the information for PCIT. Um, I hope you enjoyed our conversation uh, and got some useful information out of it. And if you'd like more information on PCIT, um, they do have a website, it's PCIT.org, and they have um, some great resources and, um, and different things for video demonstrations mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of great resources on that PCIT website.